Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, the book of Galatians, chapter 1. We're looking at this whole book is going to be sort of a commentary on saved by works, saved by grace. Are we saved by Torah keeping? going to Mount Sinai? Are we saved because we say the sacred names right? Are we saved because we go to church on the Saturday? Or are we saved because we keep the Torah, which nobody does? Are we saved because, oh, because we're a Mason and we wear the lambskin apron? Or are we saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves? It is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. So let's read the text, and the whole book of Galatians deals with that. It has some other side issues in it as well, but that's the message behind it. Um, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. And he says later on, if it's grace, it's not works. And if it's works, it's not grace. You cannot combine the two together, which is not another, Uh, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. It's not good tidings. It's bad news to say, you've got to do this. And if you don't do this, like every five seconds, you're going to go to hell. Uh, But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Yes, the perverts. The perverts are everywhere. The gospel perverts are everywhere. They're behind pulpits all over the world. They're either telling people you got to go back to Mount Sinai, or they're telling people that, well, we don't have Bible studies at our church. We go out and work in the community. That's why come we're better than all the other churches. That's just another form of work salvation is what it is. But though we are an angel from heaven, think of, uh, where are you, moron? I, the angel moron I, gave Joe Smith another Jesus Christ. Okay, gave it to him. Here you go. Here's the, here's the, they call it the restored gospel. In other words, it had been hidden all this time. No one knew what it was. And then the angel moron I comes down from heaven and says, I'm going to, I'm going to restore Christ's gospel to you. You have to be married in holy underwear. And you have to go through Masonic rituals in the secret lodge temple in Salt Lake City. That's the real salvation. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel. Unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man, any man, I don't care if they're the denominational leadership, I don't care. I don't care if it's your pastor. If any man preach, if it's me, If it's me preaching a false gospel, I should be cursed. I don't want to be cursed. Um, Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And we had kind of gone through defining the word gospel. Let the Bible tell us what the gospel is. And so we went through the gospels themselves, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, believe the gospel, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom. Um, Let's see here. Paul, it was Peter, not Paul, Peter, who said that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And the hypers, hyper dispensationalists want you to, they want you to believe. In fact, they'll call you names if you don't. Okay. Because they don't have, when people, listen, when people don't have scripture, that's when they start getting mad at you and calling you names. That's when you can tell that you're, you're winning, all right? Because they will try to convince you that Peter's gospel was a gospel of works, and it was different than Paul's gospel, a gospel of grace to the Gentiles. And that Paul was the only one who understood the mysteries. Peter didn't, James didn't, John didn't. They didn't have understanding. Paul is the only one... They're going to try to tell you, we're going to read 1 Corinthians 15. They're going to try to tell you that Paul was the only one who preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And they point you to 1 Corinthians 15 as proof of it. Well, I'll point you to 1 Corinthians 15 and show you they're lying. They're not telling the truth. And and I just, 
when they start telling me about, oh, they have other, there are other gospels for other people at other times, I'm just going, uh, that's accursed. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't fellowship with that. I can't go along with it. But that's what they're going to try to tell you. So it doesn't matter who we are. If, if somebody tells you another gospel, let him be accursed. All right? And uh, so anyway, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul, I, in, in, what, what was I getting at when I was talking about that? Paul was, uh, uh, let's see here. The, oh, it was Peter. It was Peter the, before Paul. Peter is the one who was told to go to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, and he did. And then Peter in Acts chapter 15 stands up when they're trying to determine whether or not the Gentiles should keep the law. It was Peter who stood up and said that God wanted my mouth to be the first one to teach the gospel to the Gentiles so they could believe it. Not, not Paul. It was Peter. And again, when you quote scripture, some of these people, they'll call you names. Okay. I won't tell you some of the names they call me, but they call you names, all right? 1 Corinthians 15, 1. This is going to define, it's going to actually define and solidify what we find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what was preached all throughout the book of Acts. They also say that Peter never preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And yet, in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Acts chapter 10, Acts 15, that's all Peter preached was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Here it is. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Uh, that'd be a good study for you to do. Standing versus falling. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood while everyone else fell. How did they stand? God gave them the ability to stand. He gave them the heart to stand. It was by grace that they stand. By which also ye are saved if saved if that'd be a good title to a sermon saved if what's the if i've mentioned this before back in the dinosaur age of the 80s when i had a commodore computer it's one of the early computers that coming out in the home computer market back in the 80s the explosion atari and all the game systems and everything like that people had um, Apple computers, Atari computers, I had a Commodore. I taught myself how to write basic programs, write computer programs, because they were hard to come by back then. And I taught myself by typing programs that they had printed in magazines, computer magazines. And I learned a, a command in basic. It's called if, then. And it's actually very simple. You have a variable like the letter A, and let's say I typed in a question in the program, how old are you? And the cursor is blinking after a question mark. That means I put in the, in the software code um, a, uh, waiting for an input waiting for someone to put a number there. And so when they would put in a number, let's say 50. I'm going to be 50 this year. When they put in a number like the number 50, the next line of code said that if the letter A variable equals or is less than 60, then print this particular sentence here. It says, you're not old enough, okay? It's the if then. If the letter A or the input coming in is like the number 45 or the number 50 or anything less than 60, then the program's gonna print out this. And that's what you have here. You have conditions upon which salvation is granted to people. It has nothing to do with works. It has everything to do, however, with faith, belief, and trust, and Christ's words abiding in us, like he says in John 15. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Because, and even the hypers will say this, you must believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in order to be saved. That's what he says here. But if you don't believe that, or you say you believed it yesterday, but you think it's all a bunch of hogwash, get it, hogwash, you think it's all a bunch of hooey, and you walk away from it and go back into a life of sin that's probably worse than what you came out of, that's not salvation. 
that bears no resemblance to biblical salvation. And there would be some that would say, Oh, well, they, they believed that one day, so therefore they have eternal security and, and they can't ever lose their salvation. They're going to go to heaven. They're just not going to get the rewards that I'm going to get. The Bible doesn't teach that either. It has, says nothing about it. Now, let me make this clear. True salvation, real salvation, Bible salvation, produces, number one, eternal life. It produces the Holy Spirit sealing that person and it allows that person to continue in faith. Like John said, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For had they been of us, that surely they would have continued with us. He's identifying those who are really saved and those who are not. Because we have people who come in and endure for a short while, just like Jesus taught in the parable of the seed and the sower. Uh, sower. They endure for a while, but they have no root or the, the lust of other things like thorns choke out the word and they become unfruitful. Those people are not going to heaven. And Paul used the word if here, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you believed in vain. Now he's going to identify what the four gospel writers were all about. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. And some would say, see, Paul said it first, nobody else. Paul was writing to the Corinthians. He delivered to the Corinthians first before anybody else got there because Paul had a sort of a, a philosophy of his ministry. I don't go somewhere where somebody else has already started a church. I don't build on another man's foundation. I lay the foundation. So Paul was the first one to preach this to the Corinthians, but not the first one to preach it to any of the Gentiles or anybody for that matter. It was Peter doing it on the day of Pentecost. Let me read this and we'll go back to the day of Pentecost. First of all, th uh, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. There's, this, there's the cross, according to the scriptures. And, that, and by the way, the four gospels mention this, according to the scriptures. Also, you see it all through the Old Testament. You see a picture, a foreshadowing of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Even though you don't see Christ himself being crucified, let's say in the book of Deuteronomy, you see the foreshadowing of it all through the Old Testament. The five uh, kings that Joshua hung up, he smote them and slew them, hanged them on five trees, and then put them in a tomb. It's a picture of Christ, what Christ did, how he defeated his enemies on the cross. I, I love that stuff. It's beautiful, all right? But anyway, in verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Hosea chapter 6, on, uh, after three days... After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, we will live again in his sight. So even the time prophecy was recorded for us back in the Old Testament. And then verse 5, And that he was seen of Cephas, which is Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he, now, here, I'm going to stop right here. Did Peter, James, and all of the apostles believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Yes, because they saw it with their own eyes. We haven't seen it, and yet we have a greater blessing on us because we haven't seen it, and yet we still believe. So, after that, he's seen of James and of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul's got a good attitude, doesn't he? Okay? You don't deserve what you got. I don't deserve. I don't deserve this Bible. I don't deserve anything that God has given me. But he gave it to me because of his love and his mercy and his grace. That's what I'm going to lean on the rest of my life. I had learned already 50 years of life. I... I don't do well trying to lean on my own understanding, lean on my own efforts. I don't do well. Verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Listen to what he says now. But I labored more abundantly than they all. They, the apostles, James, Cephas, all of those guys. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So here again. The laboring that I do in the Word is not 
by my own effort or my own will or my own excitement or whatever. It is the grace of God doing it through me and in me. And he said, therefore, whether it were I or they, the other apostles, so we preach and so ye believe. You know what he just said? It doesn't matter if it's me or Cephas or the 12 or James or the apostles. It doesn't matter. We all so preach and ye believe. The idea that only Paul preached the death, burial, and resurrection for people to believe in their salvation, that only Paul did that? That is not true according to this. But then let's go to Acts chapter 2 and let's look at just what the Bible says instead of having somebody send you a bunch of websites to look at or YouTube videos to watch while they ridicule everybody that disagrees with them. Acts chapter 2. Here we have the day of Pentecost. Here we have Peter, and he's preaching on the first day where the Holy Spirit is, out, is poured out, and they're speaking with the tongues that everybody could understand. And now he says, verse 22, after he quotes the prophet Joel, saying, this is that which was spoken by Joel, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's what Peter said. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Peter was preaching the death of Christ crucified Christ, whom God hath raised up. Here he's teaching the resurrection of Christ, having loosed the pains of death. That's his burial, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That's his burial. That's what it's in reference to. The fact that Jesus laid in that tomb for two days, rose on the third day, and he didn't stink. His body didn't turn to maggots. Blowflies weren't coming in and out of his nose. He, is, he would not allow Jesus' body to see corruption. And so, um, anyway, he goes on here. In uh, verse 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of both uh, the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Um, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus, and you could go on. You go to Acts 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You go to Acts chapter 10. And the same thing is coming out of, every time, like the camera turns on Peter in, this, in the book of Acts, every time the microphone comes on Peter, he's talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for salvation and how the Jews killed him and you shouldn't have. But now that you did, you can be saved. You can be forgiven. So this nonsense, this nonsense that Peter preached another gospel, which is what we're talking about in Galatians chapter 1. Not only, scripture, not only does Scripture testify against it, Paul warned those who would pervert the gospel and preach another. I don't care what time frame it was in, what dispensation it was. I don't care to what people it was. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. Peter preached it. James preached it. John preached it. Paul preached it. It was foretold in the Old Testament. David prophesied of it. Isaiah prophesied of it. I just don't, I don't buy it. I don't, I, I don't read scripture and go, you know what? I think they're right. There's no way that they're right. So when you, and I, I've had this before, when you start running all these scriptures to these guys, that's when they start calling you names because they don't have an answer to that. They don't have, all they have is a 
hyper dispensational and doctrinal statement. That's all they have. And I, I'm just, I'd hate to think that these guys that are preaching this are going to hell, but Paul said, let them be accursed. So I can't answer for them. The only thing that I can do that my conscience dictates to me is that I must preach the gospel and only the gospel to whoever that, I, that I'm dealing with, whether it's a Jew or a Gentile or whatever. I only believe one gospel, period. Past, present, future, it's the gospel. Um, let's look some more. So anyway, that's the definition of it. And it's in all four gospels. It was all preached throughout the book of Acts. Now we're seeing it as doctrine. And Paul is the one who said, um, whether it, I or they, so we preach and so you believe. They all preached it. They weren't all divided up on preaching some different gospel to these different people. Anyway, let's move on. 2 Corinthians 4, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The gospel is never hid. That's what, that's what um, Fat Albert Pike says. That's what Ellen White says. That's what the Hebrew Roots people say. That's what um, Joe Smith says. That is what um, the Azusa revival was all about. That is what um, Charles Taze Russell was all about. It was all about the idea that the, there's a truth that was buried and hidden for almost 2,000 years. First God raised up Joseph Smith, then he raised up Ellen White, then Charles Taze Russell, and then they found it at the Azusa revival. And, and all, you have all of these groups that are claiming that there's been, and the Hebrew roots the same way, they're claiming that this sacred name or this true gospel has been hid all of these years. And, and God has chosen them to restore the truth uh, that all the other churches in the whole world throughout history believed a lie. I'm going to present to you the truth. You watch out for scoundrels like that because it plainly says here, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And the gospel has not been hidden. Jesus himself said, well, you got a candle. You don't put it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Remember that song? Jesus said, would I speak into your ear that you proclaim from the housetops? There's no secret doctrine that the inner sanctum of Christianity has that the rest of the world can't know. That's, uh, that's Fat Albert Pike. This 800-page book here has a secret that they don't want out, and they can't tell everybody. You don't tell what goes on inside the lodge. That's a bunch of, that's mystery Babylon's what that is. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And I'll tell you, every one of these groups represented by these books here have been blinded to the truth. Good grief. The Hebrew roots people follow after the Jewish rabbis who Paul specifically said they're blinded in part. They have no clue. See, they go, up, they go to their teachings and say, um, since Jesus was a Jew, we must identify the Messiah the way the Jews perceived him. The Jews had him killed. They hated his guts. They said, he's not our Messiah. They had him hung on a tree. They said, oh, give us old stinky Barabbas. Oh my goodness, Barabbas, go take a bath. Oh my goodness. They let Barabbas out and killed Jesus. They don't know who the Messiah is. Why should I follow them? The God of this world has blinded the minds of these people and they don't have the first clue who the real Jesus is. You do, you should. He looks like this. This is the real Jesus. This is the Holy One that did not see corruption. 2 Corinthians 10, 16, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. If you're going to preach the gospel, don't boast. The gospel is not about letting men boast about what they did or how successful they are because of the gospel. Just preach the gospel. Quit adding boasting to it. And there is so much boasting. And I, several years ago, I got invited to a, um, a preaching 
conference down in Florida. It's probably, there was a couple guys there that I liked that I, I love their preaching, love their ministry. But other than that, it was probably the worst time I've ever had in my life. Simply because there was so much men praising there, it was sickening. Bless God, if it hadn't been for brother so-and-so, why we would be in the, we'd be in the tank by now. Bless God, if it hadn't been for doctor this and that, why doctor this and that stood for the gospel. And I'm, doctor and, and, all, and it was just all this men praising stuff. That goes on in fundamental churches. That goes on in King James churches. I hate it. The gospel should never be mixed with the boasting of others. It should be about, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's, that's the gospel. 2 Corinthians 11, 7, Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? The gospel should never be for sale or require a performance in order for someone to receive it. Never. Paul wouldn't even take their money. He wouldn't even take their money. Paul, now that does not mean that the Bible is against pastors and bishops or evangelists making their living of the gospel. The Bible teaches that specifically. That's how it's to happen. But Paul, in order to be above reproach, was a tent maker, and everywhere he set up to preach, he, started, he made tents to provide his income. He built houses, what he did, because everybody lived in tents back then. So anyway, uh, 21st century equivalent, it, it was he built and sold RVs, all right, recreational vehicles. But anyway, that's the gospel of God should never, ever, ever be for sale. And if you see, if you're in a church or you see something online, you're watching a religious program, here's what they do. God has given me wonderful revelations in and insight into the truth of the rapture and how, how God is going to work in these last days. God has given me insight into what's going to happen in America. And I would like for you to have this. This is all for number 487,212. And for your love gift to our ministry of $79.99 plus $80 shipping and handling, you can have this blessing. You, you, in fact, this is so vital. You will not be able to prosper in God's kingdom without this this knowledge, without this revelation. That guy's a crook. That guy's a liar. He's got a false gospel and a false bet blessing inside of his book or DVD. You can tell it because it's for sale. It should be free. Galatians. Um, the gospel with, that was pre, Galatians 1.11, we ain't got there yet, but he said, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. It's not man's doctrine. This was, Paul, he goes on in, in chapter 1, and we'll look into that later, to detail what happened to him after the Damascus Road. He went and visited a couple of the apostles, but after that he got away from them. He got away from them, and Jesus himself gave him direct revelations of which Paul wrote them down. He, he wrote them down in the several epistles that, that he sent out. And we have everything that God delivered to the Apostle Paul. And he's telling you, yeah, I went to see this guy over here, this guy over here. But after that, I got alone. And the gospel that I preached to you, Paul was not, Paul was not there at the crucifixion. Paul didn't see Jesus come out of the tomb. But Jesus himself told that to him accurately. Paul wasn't in the upper room where they had the, um, the Lord's Supper. Paul wasn't there, and yet he was given the exact words and everything that happened on that particular night because he writes about it. Uh, Galatians 2, 3 through 9. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. And, and I'm not going to get too much into this now. I'm going to hit on it later. But the perverts came in secretly, privily. And Paul calls them false brethren. Let me link that with this up here, if you keep in memory. Because some will say that 
all he's preaching, you can lose your salvation. No. I searched the scriptures. Salvation. I looked at all the places where the word save, saved, Savior, salvation, everything related to that word. I looked it up in the King James Bible, and I never saw the verse that said, you'll lose your salvation. Never saw it. What I did see is, is that some temporarily confess or profess and then jump out, fall away. If you keep in memory, they failed to remain in the faith. And it's just like John. John said, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, surely they would have remained with us. The Bible puts a clear distinction between those who are truly sealed by the Holy Ghost in that they will prevail in all areas of life, even unto the end. And a distinction is made to those who are false brethren. And you can do this. I did a, um, I don't know how many part study it was, I think it was on Wednesday night, on the hypocrites. How the Bible defines hypocrites and who they are. You will have people who under false pretenses, who will show themselves to be false brethren, they will be hypocrites. They might even be members of the church, deacons, board members, even pastors. They're not going to heaven. They are hypocrites and everything. And hypocrites, the, the word, you just follow that word all through the Bible. They don't go to heaven, okay? So false brethren are people who, are, who have disguised themselves knowingly or unknowingly as fellow brethren, but they're not. Their job is to pervert the gospel. Verse 5, he says, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Might continue. See, if, it's, if you really believe it, you will continue in it, and it will continue in you. It is the idea about, is, is salvation all of God's will, or is it all of man's choice? Or is it both? And the answer is both. Free choice and God's election are never contradictory to one another. God chooses the elect based upon his foreknowledge of the outcome of their belief. God knows that. God knows that person A, they went to church for a year or two, and then they fell out. They were not the elect. God knows that person B struggled all their life, but they believed every word of God and were faithful to the word. Did they have their doubts? We all do. But at the end of the day, they just said, God, I trust you no matter what. They're the elect. God's election, our choice, same thing. Okay? Uh, anyway, that the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be of somewhat... Whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me. God accepted no man's person. You know who the somewhats are? They're the guys that sit on the platform at the, at the conference. They're the, they're the men who are regarded as the, the great men, the great preacher men. And, they, and whatever they say, we must, we must believe. Dr. So-and-so is, and, and I've been offered repeatedly an honorary doctorate. I'm not necessarily against someone advancing themselves and receiving the, the uh, I guess, I don't know what to call it, but anyway, the degrees of men, I'm not against that. I know some good guys, but I also know some people in some groups that if you're not doctor so-and-so, you don't get to speak and you don't get to pastor in this church. You gotta be a doctor if you wanna be our pastor. Or we can only have the doctors come to the big evangelistic meeting. And they make sure that you know that they are doctor so-and-so. I just, I don't, you can keep all your titles. I don't want them, okay? I want nothing to do with them. Um, I want what's known of me is that what comes out of my mouth, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, is going to be what this book says. And Paul was talking about them. They, he called them the somewhats. They seemed to be, boy, they thought they were really something. And they thought maybe I'd get them on the podium and give them time to speak. And Paul said, I'm not letting you speak. They seemed to be somewhat in conference, added nothing to me. 
But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And yes, Peter did preach to the Jews. Paul did preach to the Gentiles. But this here does not give proof to a different gospel that Peter preached. In fact, when you compare this with what we know for a fact Peter preached, it was the same gospel. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, that they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. It doesn't matter that they went to the circumcision. They still went preaching and teaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified and Him resurrected from the dead. They all did. So did Paul. But the point that he's making here is they accepted me in and knowing that my ministry was different than theirs. And I, I want to say this. I want to throw this in here. Um, some of you, and I'm, I'm going to be nice about it, some of you are looking for a church. I think you should. I think you need that fellowship. Don't go looking for a church that I'm pastoring. Let me, make, let me say it this way. God gives all of His ministers a different role and a different function. Just because you go to a church, and it's King James, and they don't say some of the things that I say. And they don't really focus in their ministry on some of the things that I focus on. That does not mean that they're false teachers, that you won't listen to them, so on. It means that God has given them a different role to play. Some are more hard, harsh than I am. Some are softer than I am. It doesn't matter. God has called them to minister to their people and that's the way he made them. So if you're going looking for a church, don't use me as the measuring stick, okay? Because some of you have. Don't use me as the measuring stick. If you hear, thus saith the Lord, okay? That's one good mark for that church. You know that they're going to preach out of this Bible, okay? I think God will lead you, all right? Let's do one, well, let's see here. Let's do a couple more places here. This is, what we're doing is we're just going through the scriptures and letting the scriptures define the word gospel and how it's used. Galatians 2.11, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. Let me get my um, Hebrew roots scriptures here. Ugh! Ugh! <sighs> the Hebraic Roots Version, because here we go. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. In other words, Peter, a Jew, was sitting down with the Gentiles, eating with them. But when they were come, when James and the Jews came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. See, Peter... Peter had a lot of fear in him. Did you ever pick that up? I mean, he's got so much fear in him the day Jesus crucified that he denies him three times and curses. Why? He's afraid, doesn't want to get caught. On the day of Pentecost, he's different. But he still has a nature in him that fears what men could say or do to him. Okay? And that's what he's doing here. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. In other words, the other Jews caught on to what Peter was doing by getting away from the Gentiles, that they also did it. And that here's the Jews over here, and here's the Gentiles over here. And each one of them saying, well, them stinking Jews, I know they're not going to heaven. And them Jews are going, them stinking Gentiles, I know they're not going to heaven. I ain't going to fellowship with them. You got to watch that. You got to be careful about that. They drew Barnabas into it. Verse 14, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, what was Paul using as the measuring stick about what they were doing? Jews and Gentiles. The 
gospel because the gospel, the gospel, is preached to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. And the gospel, the real one, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, is what brings the Jews and the Gentiles together as one because as Christ saved one, so he saved the other. And the truth of it is, if you're a Jew, you're still a rotten, scumbag sinner, just like the Gentiles. It doesn't matter what heritage you come from. You're still going to die and go to hell without Christ. So he says unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, listen to this now, you Hebrew roots people, livest after the manner of the Gentiles. Catching this? Peter went and lived after the manner of the Gentiles. He ate with them. He broke bread with them. Sat around as they were eating and told little funny Jewish jokes and had a good time with them until he saw James and the Jews coming in. Then he jumped up out of his chair and went over to the other side of the room and greeted the Jews. And he said, uh, yeah, I'm glad you Jews are here. Boy, I finally got somebody I can sit and eat with. And he was a big phony. And Paul was, Paul was sitting there watching him. And when all this dissembling was going on, Paul got up, went to Peter, looked him in the eye. And I know Paul had love in his eyes. Peter, listen to me. If you, being a Jew, went and lived after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? That's what the whole Hebrew Roots movement is all about. It's the, it's the idea that the Gentiles cannot be really saved unless they go and live after the manner of the Jews. And Paul, and, and I'll tell you this, the dirty little secret of most, if not all, Hebrew roots teachers and adherents is secretly they hate Paul's guts. They hate Paul's writings. They hate it. Some are bold enough to say Paul was an imposter. He was, ne he was never, should have never had his books put in the Bible. We should take those books out of our Bible. That's what some of them are bold enough to say. You know what the rest of them say? Get ready. Well, I would much rather listen to Jesus than Paul. You know what they just did? They put Paul down to such an extent is that they want you to believe that Paul was wrong about most of what he said and that if they hear it from Jesus, then it must be true. And if Paul contradicts it, then Paul must be wrong and we only listen to Jesus. Some of them, some of them say it this way. Well, I would much rather get my doctrine from Moses who spoke directly to God than Paul. Paul spoke directly to God. His name was Jesus Christ. Remember that? Okay, but they hate Paul. They hate his guts. They don't like this stuff. And Paul looked at Peter, the Jew, and said, If you, as a Jew, were living after the manner of the Gentiles, why is it, Peter, that you're commanding that the Gentiles go live after the manner of the Jews? And Paul was saying, Peter, you're not doing right. When God saves the Gentiles, he does not command them that they go live after the manner of the Jews and say the Jewish words, the sacred words, Yahushua and Yahuhuva and all that stuff. God never told us that. God, let me tell you, let me say that again. God never told us Gentiles we had to speak Hebrew. Or that speaking Hebrew is some better way of communicating with God and it pleases God more than saying His name in our Gentile language. No scripture ever says that. It's a lie. They lied to you. And here you have a bunch of Gentiles who have been told by Jewish rabbis that they must, in order to please God and Yeshua and Yahuwah 
in order to please God, they must come and live and speak and eat and do things after the manner of the Jews or they're not really saved. And Paul jumped at Peter in front of everybody and said, Peter, you're not doing right. And he said, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And the Hebrew roots people can't stand the fact that Paul said that. So all of them have some Bible study on Galatians where they take statements like this, they twist that around three or four times, point it in some weird direction, like, now when he said the works of the law, he wasn't speaking of the Torah, the Ten Commandments, he was speaking of like Jewish traditions and so on. You see, that's, I won't even get into that. They say out of their one mouth, Paul condemned the Jewish traditions, and then when they have the Passover Seder, we follow the Jewish tradition, because that's what a Passover Seder is. It's not Jewish law. They, don't, they do not do things according to Jewish law at Passover. They do it according to Jewish tradition. And those of you Hebrew roots people, you're not going to like me. I'm not sure if I'm trying to convince people that are already in it as much as I'm trying to convince people who you have gone to and tried to talk into this nonsense. I'm trying to show them plainly the word of God that says, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We are justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, period. So what if you kept a Passover? You went out and lusted the day after or probably the day of. So what does that do to your keeping Passover? It destroys it. You have no good works. They're all gone. And if you're not going to cling to the old rugged cross, if you're not going to cling to the righteousness of Christ, you have no righteousness, and therefore you are lost. That's what the gospel, the real gospel teaches. This stuff here, Hebrew roots, sacred name, Sabbath keeping, Mormon, masonry, all that junk, that's a false gospel that requires that you say the sacred name correctly, or you go to church on Saturday, or you don't eat this, or you don't eat that. By the way, I don't believe God changed the law either concerning food. I don't believe he changed the law. And they teach that. Oh, yeah, they're telling you that God changed the law. God never changed the law. Eh, God didn't change the law. He cleaned the pig. He said, what I cleanse, call not thou unclean. Okay? Anyway, that's the gospel right there. We got a lot more to go, and we're going to move through Galatians uh, in time and in due season. But I like for people to be free. Free from the bondage that other men will place on you. You go get your Bible out and read through Galatians and ask yourself, just read Galatians, King James Bible, and then stop and ask yourself, does Paul tell me to go keep the law or does it tell me that since I can't keep the law, I must rely upon the faith of what Christ did for me. Christ is the one who did keep the law. Therefore, if you are in Christ, you are free. All right? So you just get the Bible out yourself Quit listening to everybody else and you read Galatians by yourself and ask yourself, am I saved and justified by works or by grace? Okay? Anyway, it's good to be with you today. God bless you. I love you. We'll continue this next week. Bye-bye.